So today we're talking about market risk at banks. And to make a quick recap of what we're doing in this course, we said that risk management is all about balancing risk and equity. In order to understand what our risk is as a bank, we need to understand the different risk sources. And in banking lingo, they are called risk types. And one of the most important risk types is market risk. Right. And we're going to cover what that means. But as you see, there are once again, pillar one and pillar two written under the market risk text box, which means there are once again, two approaches to calculating market risk, pillar one approach and pillar two approach. But we're going to go into what that actually means. First, we need to talk about what does market risk actually encompass. And what you see here are market parameters, right? And market risk is all about what happens to our bank when market parameters change. And with market parameters, I mean, for instance, equity prices, right? Maybe the share of Apple today is at $100 and tomorrow is at $105. What does that mean for us as a bank, right? Another thing that we're looking at at market risk is credit spreads, right? I will make a separate video on what that actually is. We're looking at interest rates, right? The interest rates might be the interest rate that the European Central Bank or the Fed in, in America sets. We're looking at exchange rates. Yeah, this means like, what is the exchange rate, for instance, between US dollars and euros? And we're looking at commodity prices, right? So for oil or gold, for instance. And as you see, I've written two columns, right? Because um, in market risk, we make a very important distinction. We make a distinction between the trading book and the banking book, trading book and banking book. And I've made a separate video on what that actually means. And I now want to tell you why it's important to make this distinction between assets which lie in the trading book and assets, assets which lie in the banking book, right? So let's think about a very simple financial instrument, a German government bond, right? And this is a bond which has maturity of one year and has a five five euro interest payment. Right? What that means is if you want to buy that bond at at the start of the year, you pay 100 euros and in the end of the year, you get 105 euros back, right? So what does that mean? So the value of the bond in general is given by the money that you get back in the end divided by one plus the interest rate that the European Central Bank sets. Right? So this is the formula for valuing a bond. I will make a separate video on why this formula actually makes sense. So this means if the interest rate of the ECB is 5%, yeah, we can just plug in the numbers into our formula. We get 105 euros at the end of year one and our interest rate is 5%. This means the value of the German government bond is 100 euros, right? However, now imagine that the interest rate is changing from 5% to 10%, right? This means that our formula for valuing the bond changes as well, right? So now we're not dividing by 1.05, but 1.1. This means that the final value of the bond now is at 95 euros, right? So what you see is if the interest rate of the European Central Bank changes, the value of our bond changes as well. And what does that mean for us as a bank? If I plan to sell my German government bond short term, right? So let's say I buy it at the beginning here of the year and I want to sell it after two months. This is very relevant for me, right? Because I can sell it for less than I bought it, right? So there is a risk there, right? There's the risk of making a loss for me. However, if I plan to buy the bond at time zero and to receive the final payment from the German government, price changes in the middle are not as relevant for me, right? So in other words, if I do not plan on selling the bond during the year market risk, then the market parameters don't influence my income. Right. And that is why in market risk, we need to make a distinction between assets which are held for short term and assets which are held until maturity. Right. And when we're talking about the pillar one approach to market risk, 
the ECB actually defines what banks need to consider when calculating their pillar one market risk. And they need to consider all assets in the trading book, right? Because those are all assets which are immediately affected by changes in market parameters because the bank wants to sell them short term. And the bank also needs to look at commodity prices and exchange rates. Why is that the case? Think about our German government bond once again. But now this German government bond runs for two years, right? So I have a two year German government bond. Once again, I get a five euro interest payment. And let's think about a change in exchange rates, right? Maybe I'm a US dollar bank and I get an exchange payment here after year one, right? If my exchange rates change, then my exchange payment in dollars will change as well, right? If, if, the, in, if the exchange rate between dollars and euros change, then the payment that I actually get out of the bond in dollars changes as well. So there is a market risk here as well that is immediately, immediately relevant for the income statement of a bank, right? Okay, so let's recap. In our pillar one approach to market risk, we're only looking at assets in the trading book and we're only looking as, at effects from exchange rates and commodity prices for assets in the banking book. We do not care about interest rates, sorry, for assets in the banking book as assets in the banking book are held long-term. So a change in interest rates does not matter as much when it comes to our immediate income as a bank. So when we talk about how pillar one actually calculates market risk, the focus of pillar one is on the immediate impact of market parameters on the income statement of the bank. And as you probably guessed, what we are trying to do is we're trying to obtain risk weighted assets for a market risk. Right. If you don't know what risk-weighted assets are, look at my video on Basel 3. And risk-weighted assets for market risk basically depend on the maturity of the bond or the asset and on the riskiness of the asset. So you can imagine that there is a higher risk to my asset if it runs for the next 10 years than, it, than, when, it also, than when it only runs for the next month. There are a lot more possibilities in the next 10 years than in the next month. Right? And it's also, of course, relevant if my asset is a very stable government like the um, American government or if it's like a very shaky company, let's say, like Tesla, for instance. Right? And what basically happens if you want to obtain your risk-weighted assets for, um, for your eligible assets, let's say you have a Tesla stock in the trading book, right, which is worth, I don't know, maybe $100. $100 your risk-weighted assets will be given by those $100 times a weighting factor, right? And this weighting factor will be given by the banking regulation. So by the banking regulation, right? And the formula is actually more complicated in real life, but what basically happens if you ha is you have the value of the asset and then you weigh this value with a certain weighting factor, right? And this in this case, we would get uh, risk-weighted assets of $10 for a Tesla stock. And maybe we also have an Apple stock and this Apple stock is worth 200 euros and the weighting factor for Apple is quite similar. It's also 0 0.1. So our, our risk weighted assets for the Apple stock would be $20. And if those are our only assets eligible for market risk in pillar one, we would just sum them up and we would get risk weighted assets of $30 for our bank, right? So maybe to recap, what we have is in, in, in market risk, we need to, we try to understand which change, what changes in market parameters actually affect the income stream of the bank. And for this, it is very relevant to understand if the bank wants to, wants to sell an asset short term or if the bank wants to hold the asset longer term, because depending on this decision, market parameters have different consequences on the income stream of the bank. And in pillar one, we basically try to, to understand how big is the risk for the income statement of the bank 
and we do this by calculating risk weighted assets for all assets in the trading book and for the risk parameters of exchange rates and commodity prices in the banking book. And when we're talking about pillar two, in pillar two, we do all the things we do in pillar one, but we also do something that is called IRRBB or interest rate risk in the banking book. And I will make a separate video on this and this is actually going to be the next to the, the topic of the next video.